This occasion is also an opportunity for the university to recognize an exemplary business leader who today will become an honorary member of the graduating class. Uh, this honor recognizes persons who have made ex an exceptional contribution to society, in this case, in the, in the field of worldwide hotel management. To such a person, we grant the university's highest honor and distinction, the Honorary Doctor of Laws degree. To escort the candidate to the podium and to present the degree, uh, we have the president of our university, Andrew K. Benton, the dean of the School of Business, Dr. Linda A. Livingstone, Senior Vice President for Planning Information and Technology, Dr. Nancy Magnuson. Would you welcome all of these to the podium, please? President Benton, today it is my privilege to introduce a man who has dedicated his life to the business of travel easing the burden and stress of the journey and of the sojourner, be it business person, tourist, or one only passing through. Wolf H. Hinkst is the retired president of Worldwide Operations for Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts, operating 81 luxury hotels, spas, and resorts. During his 30-year career with Four Seasons, Mr. Hinkst opened markets in the eastern United States, the Caribbean, Europe and Asia, and successfully integrated the acquisition of the Regent International Hotels organization into Four Seasons. Widely respected in the business community, Mr. Hinkst is a recipient of the J.D. Power and Associates Founders Award and has received an honorary degree from Johnson and Wales University of Rhode Island. He also sits on numerous advisory boards, one of which I've had the privilege to serve with him on, the Graduate Management Admissions Council. Mr. Hinkst is a philanthropist supporting and serving on the boards of many arts organizations as well as the Muscular Dystri Dystrophy Association of Houston, Texas. A devoted husband to his wife, Julia Perry, he is a proud father to three college graduates, Elias, Benjamin, and Julia. President Benton, it is my distinct honor and privilege to present Wolf H. Hinkst for Pepperdine University's preeminent distinction, the Honorary Doctor of Laws degree. Thank you, Dean Livingstone. Wolf H. Hengst, because of your lifelong dedication to the traveler, making the destination and lodgings not only pleasant and attractive, but experiences of high art to be coveted and remembered. Because of your willingness to share the benefit of your wisdom and experience lecturing to colleges, serving as an advisor, board member, mentor, to educational, charitable, and business institutions alike, because your life and career reflected in the successes of those lives touched by your own, namely your family and your co-workers, your business partners and friends. That is an inspiration to us and especially our students. Therefore, by the power vested in me by the Pepperdine University Board of Regents, I now confer upon you the Honorary Doctor of Laws degree with all the rights, all the duties, and all the privileges thereto appertaining. Congratulations, sir. First of all, I have to say, if I start coughing, don't start breaking out in laughter. I brought this in from New York. I'm going to have to take some water in between. It's um, it, uh, President Benton, distinguished faculty, parents, friends, family members, ladies and gentlemen, and graduates. I'm really deeply honored and grateful and humbled and to be conferred this honorary degree by President Benton and Pepperdine University. Dean Livingston, thank you for your most kind and generous introduction. It's not only an honor, but also a pleasure for me to be here today and to speak about a subject that I care deeply about, the role of service in personal and professional success. I recognize that these are very, very difficult times, and actually I sort of wish I could give you the future in a bowl. Um, you're looking for encouraging words about the future, 
well as an optimist and someone who's lived through many difficult times and tough times, I'm hopeful that I can bring some encouragement to you. While you may be facing an uncertain future, you are also facing a moment of opportunity. You are at a turning point in your lives, and while some of the traditional roots of success may not be immediately open, you are free to re reflect more deeply about what you really want out of your lives and what really constitutes success personally and professionally. This is a moment to look deep within yourself, examine your personal values, focus on your personal ethics, because they will be the best guide as you navigate through your career. I read an article recently by Howard Gardner, psychologist at Harvard University, and he talks about the difference between a good job and good work. If you are fortunate, as I have been fortunate, you will not simply find a good job, one that challenges your, challenges your intellectual skills, but good work, which fulfills your emotional needs as well. Gardner defines good work as calling that combines excellent performance, expresses one's ethics, and offers a pleasing sense of engagement. I don't know what brings you a sense of personal engagement, but for me, the key to professional and personal satisfaction has always <coughs> revolved around a passion for service. Excuse me. Service is the foundation upon which I have built my career and upon which Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts built its reputation for excellence. I'm pleased to see that the mission of Pepperdine University and the business school has values that are very similar to the ones that I have and certainly Four Seasons has. And I want to mention just three that are in your mission statement. A successful leader is a value-centered value leader. Successful management seeks collective good along with individual profit. A culture of service will secure long-term rewards no matter what your field of work. In fact, contrary to the greed is good view of life, I and the organization I worked for for 30 years was guided by the golden rule view of life. Treat others as you wish to be treated. Believe me, it works. In my journey through life as an immigrant child from Germany to an orphanage in a small Australian town, to president of Four Seasons Hotels, treating people well and providing service has brought not only financial, but emotional success, that inner feeling of having done something valuable and worthwhile. It's a crucial ingredient in good work. Because what does service do when you give it and receive it? It provides happiness to your customers, your employees, and yourself. And there is nothing more important and greater than making people happy. Managing people and building an organization that delivers quality service is not easy. It's the cumulative effect of people, systems, and a culture which is dynamic and created over a long period of time. It depends on many integrated actions from how employees are chosen, managed, and how standards are created and taught. In fact, quality service is delivered one employee at a time. And from my experience, it takes a fanatic and constant attention to detail, to getting everything right, that results in great companies maintaining standards of excellence day in and day out. I know what I'm speaking about, since during the years at Four Seasons, Four Seasons pretty much won every award in the book, from Zagat's to Condé Nast Travel, J.D. Power. We've been singled out by management gurus um, throughout the country, and are the only hotel company to be recognized in Fortune Magazine's list of 100 best companies to work for in America 11 years in a row. How has all of this come about? Basically, because Four Seasons does not regard service as a frill. 
it's viewed as a product and our competitive advantage and our number one strategic marketing weapon. And it can be your competitive advantage as well. Let me be more specific and share some of the life lessons I've learned about the role of service in professional and personal success. First, leadership is built through strong, positive relationships with people, through human moments of connection that are about serving each other and treating each other well. It's instructive that during my first interview with Izzy Sharp, the founder and chairman of Four Seasons Hotel, he didn't ask any typical questions about technical questions, and he assumed that the technical issues that I would know that were on my resume. He wanted to know who I was as a human being, how I would interact with other people. He said, if people treat, if, I'm sorry, if you treat people properly, profits will follow. I've never forgotten those words, and they directly lead me to my next point. Two, values count. Find a company that shares your values. If you don't, you'll be miserable, and your career will never work out. I've learned the lesson the hard way. When I was in my early 30s, and I was managing an 800-room hotel in Washington, D.C., I was making exceptional money and great benefits and everything that went along with it. And one day I was faced with an ethical dilemma. The hotel was experiencing serious cash flow problems. The hotel's owners and my superiors in the management company had some ideas on how to improve the bottom line and cash flow. Aside from making many cuts, including in the laundry, where we had 100 employees and where the working conditions were terrible and deplorable, even worse, that they demanded that we temporarily withhold social security payments from the government, which was clearly illegal. For me, that was it. I knew that I couldn't stay with the company. I refused to do it, and I was fired on the spot, allegedly, for re refusing cost-cutting instructions. In the short run, standing up for my convictions was not only risky, it was financially devastating, and it was humiliating. But in the long run, it was the best thing that I ever did. Because it led to my taking a position of Four Seasons, a company whose core values, as it turned out, were a perfect match for mine, and where I then spent the rest of my career. Three, implement the golden rule up and down the line. A culture that attracts people who live to serve is not about people being subservient. It's about creating an egalitarian spirit in which no one is better than the other person and teamwork is paramount. At all Four Seasons hotels, for example, there are no preferential parking spots and everyone from general manager to the dishwasher eats in the same employee restaurant. Victories are celebrated as a group. Staff birthdays are recognized for everyone. Now, these things may sound like small things for you, but in fact, they're huge. Building morale and a sense within an organization that it's one for all and all for one. Four Seasons insists on these egalitarian rules in every location in which it operates. That, by the way, is not always easy. In India, for example, local people we interviewed, both at the top of the organization and at the bottom of the organization, didn't think it was appropriate for, say, a general manager to eat at the same table as someone who's washing dishes. But we insisted on the approach, and it worked. So experience has taught me that decency has no borders. The culture of the company, no matter where you go, and despite <coughs> what appear to be cultural hurdle, hurdles, it works beautifully, I assure you. Excuse me. Our approach, in fact, has produced <coughs> enormous dividends. Today, Four Seasons is the employer of choice, wherever it goes, around the world, because of its reputation of treating workers well, up and down the line. That leads me to another life lesson. Four, good managers make employees feel like a million bucks to make them the heroes they are. 
Treating people well empowers employees to do the right thing on their own. And when you have 30,000 employees who go to work each day thinking, creating, inventing new ways to make a perfect guest experience, then you have to, have to have a culture in which good times and bad, but especially during a time of crisis, employees perform like heroes. Here's one real life example out of many. One of the hotels in the Maldives went through the devastating tsunami. When the wave struck, the quick thinking employees acted intuitively to ensure the safety of the guests and each other. A number were credited with saving lives. Within 24 hours, they evacuated everyone on boats, went to a neighboring island, and then flew all guests to safety. Shortly after the event, we received many, many letters. And there's one from a guest that I'd like to quote from, which talks about the experience and dedication and commitment of the employees on that day. He wrote, and I quote, let me stress that our group's strength rests on rock. This rock is firstly made up of the lower level local employees who, while having been selected for doing their job well, have shown in a time of utmost crisis their true values and a level of ded dedication that no training and no amount of money can ever generate. It is innate and ingrained in them." Unquote. How proud we were and how right our guest was, because a hotel is also sort of like an iceberg. Two-thirds two of, of everything is hidden underwater and only one-third is visible on the top. You cannot make the organization work if everyone from dishwashers and housekeepers to gardeners and those at the front desk don't have a sense of pride and passion. I believe that is true for every industry and business. It's the two-thirds you don't see that makes the one-third you see work. Five, love the journey, not the destination. When you are beginning a career, you're always focused on the future, the next step, the next career move, and with it all, the destination dreams of success. And when you're older, you realize, as I and others have, that the great gifts of life are in the present, in the small moments, at work, at home, at your graduation, with your friends and your family, when you connect with others, when you focus and take pleasure in the here and now. That is when you learn to love and appreciate the everyday journey. I've observed the people driven, that people are driven only by the desire for wealth and power actually often become depressed in midlife. Why? Because having sacrificed human relationships and the joy of service, they now feel empty and their lives feel meaningless. They have never stepped back and asked themselves, is the work I'm doing really meaningful to me? To this point, the Dalai Lama once said, as long as your existence is meaningful to others, your own life has meaning. No one better understands the broader and more profound meaning of service than the gentleman who's about to become the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. Regardless of whether you voted for him or not, his life and career choices are a role model for all of us. Obama's vision of America is inclusive and idealistic, and I believe he has tapped into a dormant civic idealism and a hunger among young people to serve a greater cause than themselves. He has suggested, amongst other things, providing college tuition to anyone willing to give two years of service to the country. I believe that public service, especially in today's times, when traditional career paths may be temp temporarily unavailable, is a career opportunity worth thinking about. When I look back at the economic cycles and different difficult times that I've lived through, recessions, 9-1, 9-11, tsunamis, earthquakes, bomb threats, to name just a few, what I have come to realize is that difficult times create stronger and better managers. Today you are facing difficult times. Your expectations are different from those you ended with because the times are different. However, I believe you will emerge as stronger, wiser managers and human beings. Let me con conclude with some practical advice. One, don't confuse the short-term and long-term goals. Short-term financial gains are not what count. A fulfilling and meaningful 
career, good work, is what you're after. So be willing to compromise on your salary and title in the short run to find an organization you feel is the right emotional fit in the long run. Two, whatever your career path, find a company with a service culture because it will do better in the long run. All successful companies built to last provide great service. In today's digital age, the critical difference between success and in failure, in fact, is providing quality service. Whether you're talking about Apple Computer versus Microsoft or Saks versus Nordstrom or one phone company versus the other, service will continue to be the key to success. Three, be flexible. Be willing to relocate to regions of the country or to other countries. In my experience, there's nothing like exposure to different cultures and places in the world to grow as a person as well as a manager. Four, finally, be positive. A few years ago, I read about a high school gradu graduation ceremony in Upper State, New York. I've never forgotten the words spoken by the valedictorian. She was a paraplegic and talked about the challenges of job search and life. And she said, don't let what you can't do define what you can do. Inspiring words. I believe that out of today's economic crisis will arise a new and better tomorrow, one that is built to succeed in the 21st century, and one that will be led by you and your peers who have been honed, tested, and come out on top. America is a great country which always rises to the challenge. So take heart, whatever your career path, look at the difficult times as an opportunity to find and discover what for you is good work. Look for meaning and joy, and don't let what you can't do define what you can do. Thank you.